We are very blessed to have Karen Fortune here. She serves as the managing partner for uh, of AIG Forensics and Valuation. She also oversees the firm's commercial forensic accounting and litigation services practices. Uh, Karen has over 25 years of experience in both public and private practice. And she's gonna talk a little bit about today uh, fraud prevention for local government. So without further ado, everyone, Karen Fortune. Hey there. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate uh, you guys being here. And uh, like Dan said, we'd like to make this as interactive as possible. So any questions or if you have a microphone and, and have some examples of the things that we're going to be talking about today, please, by all means, uh, feel free to share. But today we're going to be focused on uh, looking at the risks of phishing and other social engineering uh, attacks that might uh, transpire in our local governments. And so this is my glamour shot here. Uh, my name is Karen Fortune and I'm with IAG Forensics and Valuation, that's Investigative Accounting Group. And um, I've been practicing for quite some time. Um, most of my practice is really in commercial litigation and fraud investigation. So a lot of what we're going to talk about today, uh, I've seen in my practice as a forensic accountant. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about statistics and why um, these things matter. Why are we talking about these things today? And the first thing is that there are lots of breaches that occur every year. And I've shared a little bit of information here. I won't go too far in depth to bore you, but 70% um, of the breaches across all different sectors come from the outside. And so that just tells us that there's a lot of security issues that we face. Uh, when it comes to the public sector, it's fairly interesting. Um, almost 60% are coming from outside actors, but there's a lot of inside uh, involvement. So that's, that is a concern that I think we in our organizations need to be uh, aware of and to address. Um, in addition, it's fairly telling that um, in the public sector, 61% of the malware uh, breaches involved ransomware. And we're gonna talk a little bit about ransomware in a second, but that's something that we have seen in our practice um, in my fraud investigations. Now, what I will say is I am a CPA and I have other credentials around um, forensic accounting. So I'm not necessarily going to be speaking to you as an IT um, person. I don't have uh, computer expertise per se other than that which I've been involved in with the financial investigations, but I do want to uh, share examples as we go forward. Um, a lot of uh, breaches that we're gonna talk about do involve phishing, they involve um, stolen credentials, and so we'll talk about some of the things that we can do in or our organizations to prevent that. So in terms of some of the statistics for 2019, this was the most recent crime report that the FBI had posted um, when I was putting together this presentation, but it's fairly telling that um, they field lots and lots of complaints. So you see that they field about 467,000 complaints a year. Um, they don't necessarily take on all of those different uh, cases. And so when you look at the number of incidences that they took on. Um, they took on in 2019, 1,300 incidents um, that had $384 million worth of losses. That average is about $293,000 per loss per incident. And so it's really important um, to organizations. That's a lot of money for um, most of us. And, uh, and this is the average loss prior to the FBI's recovery. Now, the good news is when the FBI decides to take on a case, there has been historically about a 70 to 79% uh, recovery, um, but they obviously pick and choose which cases they're, they're gonna take on. 
So I mentioned ransomware earlier and governments um, are a, a target for sure um, in the ransomware area. And I'll share a story later in the presentation about another organization, a pra medical practice that got a ransomware attack. But what we see is that these are on the rise and the uh, fraudsters are getting a little greedier. So there was an average um, ransom of thirty thousand dollars back in 2017, the average has gone up to three hundred eighty thousand in 2019. And uh, according to the local uh, state government security report that was published in August of 2020 by Blue Voyance, they are going up as much as a million dollars or more, depending on uh, what the fraudsters think that they can get out of us. So what we're going to talk about today. It, now that we've sort of established the, the background and the level of fraud and the losses that can be incurred, we're going to try to talk a little bit about some of the social engineering schemes. We're going to talk about the red flags. Uh, what are some of the internal controls that we can put into place? Um, and then I've got some resources at the end. So the various schemes that we're going to talk about today are listed here. And uh, I'd just like to pose a question, um, Dan, before we go too far in. Um, has anyone in the audience had a, a fraud attack or a, a phishing attack or social engineering attack um, in their particular local governments? And if so, I'd, I'd love for you to, to, you know, I'd love to know who in the audience has experienced this. In the meantime, we'll go through these. Um, and Again, Dan, please. Have, uh, Karen, I have one. So okay. uh, somebody could comment, uh, many attempts. Many attempts. Okay, any get through? Any get through there? Nobody, uh, nobody's raising nobody's their acknowledging it. Okay. Well, I can guarantee you that everybody's had many attempts um, because this is a, a pervasive problem. But we're going to talk about these various engineer, social engineering schemes. Um, the vendor and executive impersonation is one that I think um, is going to continue to increase. And so I wanted to talk about that uh, in particular. We've got phishing. Um, discarded technology and quid pro quo or mistaken payment and then tech support fraud and we're going to talk in detail about each of, of these and what they might look like so the first thing we're going to talk about is the vendor and executive uh, impersonation and with regard to this um, there can be any number of ways that um, these attacks might be initiated but typically what you will have is a, a bad actor um, impersonating either a vendor or some sort of authority figure or executive. And they're doing so through either a phone call, they can do it through a letter or email, um, and indicating that there is an action that needs to be taken. And a lot of times there is a rush that is put on this and they're asking, um, for somebody to respond quickly, um, or they're notifying of a change in um, the way that business is going to be done. And so I had a couple of examples of this, um, and, and I'm not going to read the slide to you. You can certainly read what's in front of you. But one of the examples that our firm got involved with in a, in a fraud investigation had to do with, uh, it was a consulting firm. And an outside CPA, now this won't be a local government, but just to give you the flavor, the outside CPA who was working with this particular consulting firm um, set up a separate account um, in the name of the company, but he was, and he had access to account information. He had access to a lot of the, the customer and client files. So he knew um, who the various customers and clients were for this particular consulting firm. He set up a separate account and what he then did was he contacted the customers and clients and directed them. He actually sent letters and directed them to pay their invoices 
to this new bank account. And as a result, many of the customers and clients did so. Um, what ended up happening uh, was that obviously this other bank account started to be enriched to the detriment of the normal business banking account. And as a result, this, uh, we'll call it a shadow account, that's what we called it back then, um, the outside CPA was able to use it to fund his lifestyle. He paid for his children's college, uh, his daughter's wedding, and bought a new lake house with the money. Um, in the meantime, the, the owner of the consulting firm um, lost his house and ended up, he and his wife had to move into an apartment. He didn't understand why his business was suffering so much. He relied on the CPA uh, heavily to um, make sure that he was taking care of the books and records and making sure that um, the business was running smoothly. He was not able to retire uh, at the age that he wanted to and finally um, asked for help. And when we investigated with counsel, with the attorneys, we determined what happened and, and several million dollars had been uh, transferred over. Um, he did not, as a small business owner, uh, have robust records to be able to follow up with all of his accounts receivable. And unfortunately, as a result of this, um, there was a lot of litigation that ensued. They were able, uh, the consulting company was able to recover um, part of the money, not all of the money. And um, so that was a, a fairly sad story, but it was an easy um, thing to catch if you're paying attention to um, the flow of funds and, and making sure that your clients and everyone are paying on time. But unfortunately, this particular fraudster had access to important information and was able to divert um, funds that were uh, related to um, a company that he really didn't have an interest in. Um, the other instance that we had um, with regard to uh, this type of impersonation was a municipality. And what, what happened here was um, there was an AP clerk that received via email invoices from a particular um, vendor who she was not familiar with, but she looked up the vendor in their accounting system and did locate uh, this particular vendor name. Of note, this vendor looked a little odd in the system, and it turns out it was because it had been done through a quick setup and not gone through the normal uh, process of setup. And so what you had was uh, somebody had put this vendor account into the accounting system, and once the, um, the vendor invoices started coming in, the clerk needed to know, well, how do I, you know, do I pay this or not pay it? She thought it was a little suspicious, so she actually did talk to her supervisor. And this is sort of where uh, we all come in, um, in terms of the, the supervisors and leaders in the group. When she approached her supervisor, the supervisor was in a hurry, didn't really want to pay attention, asked if the vendor was a legitimate or was, you know, a, an approved vendor. And she said, well, they're in the system. And the response was, well, go ahead and pay it go ahead and pay it. And so she did. Um, it turns out she ended up paying several hundred thousand dollars to this particular vendor and it was not a legitimate vendor. Um, the director of contracts had actually gone in and circumvented a number of the controls that were supposed to be in place and did a quick setup on this particular, um, on the system for the vendor account and approved his own fake company. And so when the bills would come in, when he would basically send the bills in um, from this purported company, there was something to um, attribute it to. And so that was another instance that um, we were able to quantify at least uh, the damages. Um, but again, we need to take the time um, to make sure that we um, are directing our staff as best we can. Now I have an example in this next slide of uh, a particular instance. This was something that was sent to 
one of our clients, and some of these are kind of funny um, because you would think, well, who could possibly be fooled by this? And and they weren't, but this is a, a impersonating the director of the FBI. And so what you'll see here is a, a letter that was sent. Um, I've deleted the sent to, um, to, to protect the, the innocent, our, our clients that have shared these things with us. But as you can see, if you spend any amount of time looking at the email, there's all kinds of nonsensical things in here. And uh, for example, I've got the bogus email address and you can see that there's terrible grammar and verbiage um, included in here. And I'll just read some of this to you. I guess it will interest you to know why this investigation was conducted. And for your information, it was truly confirmed that you have a 100% legitimate unpaid transaction. And it just continues and is a run on sentence. And so again, these are fairly nonsensical, um, but these are examples of things that will come across your desk probably on a regular basis, unless you have a, a robust um, spam catcher or uh, security to, to keep these from coming through. And the, the critical thing about this is when you look at um, the next page, this is sort of the bottom of the email, you'll see that they're actually asking for personal data. And this is a way um, that, as we'll see in a minute, phishing and, and other things can happen. Or if you were to click on some of these email links, um, that's where malware potentially can get installed uh, on your computers. And, and we've had that happen to, to clients. Um, but there are a lot of things that you can call your staff's attention when you're trying to train them or keep them apprised of, of what they need to be looking for. Uh, you'll see here in this particular um, email that the email address changes. Um, so these fraudsters didn't take a lot of time to make sure that this has uh, been designed in such a way to fool many people. But again, it is, it is a risk. Okay, so now we'll look at phishing, and phishing is where you have somebody that will send um, all kinds of things. It can be uh, a link for um, free credit report, as I have here. It could be a happy birthday. Um, it could be you've you've won something. Um, but it's it's an email that gets sent out um, that looks potentially not like the last email, but potentially legitimate and. Um, I've had them come through um, to me in my personal or in my work email where, let's say Chase Bank, if I happen to have a mortgage with them, Chase Bank sends me, you can refinance your mortgage. And if you were to click on it, then all of a sudden your data is exposed. And so that is the thing that we're trying to avoid here. Now, we had a client that was, um, the victim of a malware slash ransomware attack through phishing. And what had happened was this particular medical practice received an email and the email invited um, the, the administrator and it knew to go to the administrator um, to renew licensing for the particular practice. And it looked official. It had uh, a lot of the, the, the right verbiage in it. It had the right credentialing agency name, um, contact information, et cetera. And it was a very well spoofed uh, email. And what happened was she clicked on it to begin the renewal process. And as a result, ransomware was immediately uploaded into their computer system. The sad thing was this was a cancer treatment center and it not only affected their billing and their patient data, uh, but it also then shut down their cancer screening machine because it was all part of the same computer um, network. And they were able to tie the cancer screening um, uh, x-ray type stuff into the patient files and it was all integrated. Um, and as a result of this ransomware, they were not able to access any of it. The demand was for over $500,000 and it took a month 
before they were able to get their data released. The FBI did get involved. Um, they did not pay the ransom, and that's why I think the, the month uh, transpired, but they did end up losing a considerable amount of money because they lost historical records that had to be rebuilt and um, they weren't able to um, necessarily get all their billing um, information back. And so they know that they lost some of the um, accounts receivable that they believe that they had previously. So that was a, a situation where, um, you know, the administrator thought she was doing her job and yet it was a, a well spoofed um, fishing expedition. Here is another uh, example of uh, fishing. And you can see here, this is another fun one because it it um, is offering a considerable amount of money saying that you have a, a box with customs with three and a half million dollars in it. And um, as a result, you know, you need to reply to the email address that's given. And, um, you know, these these email addresses you can see are being sent to uh, from John P. Torres, and then it's got uh, recipients the same, and then down below it's got a, a different email address. Um, and then if you read some of the text here, it's obviously very poor grammar, run on sentences. Um, they don't spell, spell the word where correctly. Um, so this is another example of uh, a phishing email that has you know some identifiers in it that would be obvious um, i was not able to get uh, the the spoofed email from our client i wouldn't share that anyways it has their names in it but um, that one looked really um, quite real and so that's just another thing that we need to be super super careful about um, with regard to discarded technology um, this is, I think, a fairly obvious thing that we don't want to throw our computers out or thumb drives out with data on them. Um, if you leave data on your thumb drive um, or on your computer, that's just an invitation for someone to get identifying information. And so um, before you discard your technology, you're going to want to clean it and wipe it and your IT departments, I'm sure. Um, have the ability to do so, but make sure that you're doing that safely so you're not exposing your data out there. Um, with regard to the quid pro quo or mistaken payment, um, this is a situation where you've got um, somebody sending you money or um, offering you something and then um, trying to get you to pay them back in return. Um, there are examples where you might be able to claim a prize, um, but you have to provide some information to them. So you're either going to pay a small amount to uh, get something big, or you're going to provide personal information or um, banking information from, from the local government even to uh, claim a refund or that type of thing. And so this is something that we need to be very careful about. Um, this is another one where we had a, a situation and it was just um, fairly hard to believe. I'll just leave it at that. But a law firm um, was approached on the internet um, by a potential client, this law firm, actually is located, uh, the main office was out in the West Coast, but they had a, an Atlanta uh, office and that's how we, we got the call. But uh, the law firm on the West Coast was approached by email from an Asian entity saying that they wanted to hire them for a business transaction um, that was gonna take place, I believe in California. The law firm was then paid about $50,000 and $50,000 was transferred to the law firm from this Asian entity. Um, it was put into their IOLTA account, which is basically their trust account for client funds. And as a result, 
they believed that they were going to be representing this, this Asian company. Well, ultimately, the Asian company contacted the lawyer and said, you know what, we're, we're not going through. The deal fell through. We don't need your services anymore. Thank you very much. And would you please return the funds? And they actually um, sent a link saying, if you could please um, click on the, you know, click on this link or send it to this this account, um, you know, you can you can wire it to us that way. Essentially, click on here and send us the money back. And so, unfortunately, the firm administrator um, did that and was returning the funds. She had approval to return the funds, but unfortunately did it this way. And this allowed the fraudster to get into their IOLTA and they emptied it out. And we're talking um, a few million dollars. And unfortunately, because this was a fairly um, sophisticated actor, even the FBI got involved um, and local law enforcement was not able to handle it. Um, but they were not able to recover the monies. Now they did have insurance, thankfully, um, and that insurance um, helped pay for some of what what had happened. But uh, suffice it to say, when we are issuing a refund, there are safer ways than clicking on links from companies and people we have never met. And so that was a again fairly hard to believe situation, but. Um, they, they unfortunately were victims uh, of that fraud as well. Um, here's just another um, a notification. You, you've, you've got an inheritance or a contract payment. Uh, this was another email, and this is from the Central Bank of Nigeria, which already is a huge red flag for all of us. Um, but this was another instance where you, if you will just provide us this quid pro quo, if you'll just provide us this information that we're requesting, um, you will be able to get your $10,500,000. Um, and so again, you can see the, the nonsensical language in it, but the big po point here is not to provide um, these very um, clear identifiers of how you know their ATM card, your bank coordinate, which is not a way that we would talk anyways, but basically your banking information, um, providing your name. There are a number of times when people will be asked for their social security numbers um, and that type of thing. And we just, we wanna make sure our teams know better than to do that. Okay, tech support fraud um, is another um, instance I have not had any cases that have involved the tech support fraud um, situation, but this is a, where you have somebody who's been able to access your computer and are um, causing pop-ups to occur, or they are contacting um, your personnel saying, hey, um, we've noticed that your computer is at risk. We've noticed that um, you're having issues, it's slow or whatever, and we are here to fix your problem for you. They may either ask for you to pay for them to fix the problem, or they might ask you to give them access. Like I'm from Microsoft and I want access to your computer so we can fix this for you. And if someone's not paying attention, then they might let them uh, have access. And so once they have access remotely to that person's computer, they can go wherever they want to. And so this is a, another situation that we just need to make sure that our staff is, is aware of um, the risks there. There are some funny videos on uh, YouTube. I don't know if uh, any of you are YouTube watchers, but Kit, Kit Boga, it's K-I-T-B-O-G-A, um, this is a fellow who's pretty funny who will um, spoof himself and he will pretend to be an old lady or someone that's very naive and allow fraudsters to get on his computer and he ends up wasting their day um, so they can't actually victimize real people. And he, he, he doesn't have anything um, on his computer that can be really exposed and he drives these people crazy. So if you want 
um, some late night YouTube watching. Kit, Kit Boga is, is a funny one to watch. So those are basically our um, different types of fraud schemes that um, we have seen or that uh, we need to be aware of. And before I go forward, does anyone have any questions? Dan, are there any questions? Doesn't look like any questions, Karen. I think we're good. Okay, well, we'll keep rocking. Um, so the next thing we're gonna talk about are red flags. And these are things that hopefully you will be able to share with your team and to make sure that they are aware, um, as I'm sure you all are very well aware of what these red flags might look like. But um, just in case, you know, we'll, we'll definitely go through them. And this is this is going to be fairly important for us to to uh, focus on with our team. So one of the things that we will always um, talk about are outside threats and inside threats. And as we looked at the statistics earlier, there's a lot of outside threats um, with the, the local governments. It's almost 60 percent of the the problems are coming from the outside. So when we. Um, are training our people, what we're going to want to make sure that they understand is if an invoice um, looks different um, or if the vendor maybe changed their logo or the, the spelling, that type of thing, you want to make sure that um, they question it instead of just process, 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 because that's something that I think if we get in a really big hurry, then we can miss what might appear later to be an obvious tell. And so we have had situations in in our cases where there have been fraudulent invoices, um, and many of these have actually been inside actors, um, have used Adobe and they've dummied up invoices. Um, and in doing so, it, it basically changes the look ever so slightly. But um, this is this is something with Adobe and, and other um, newsletter creators, you can easily spoof somebody else's invoice. And so um, ask your team to really pay attention to what they're processing and making sure that it's going through all the proper approval processes there. Um, if there's ever, you know, a rush, please get this process. You need to get it processed right now. Um, and a lot of times that will come from the uh, the uh, executive impersonator um, saying process this now and um, we're, we're going to lose we're going to lose this bond um, if we don't get this done quickly, et cetera. Um, and so that's something that um, when you have n nervous people processing and they defer to leadership readily and not question. Um, then that can lead to a lot of problems. And so we want to create environments where people can ask questions and we want to make sure also um, that we are paying attention to their question and actually looking at it. Like the example I gave you earlier with that um, municipality where the supervisor just said, just pay it. There was not a, a, any sort of review process there. And so let's make sure that, that we are doing that. Um, if you happen to have, you know, these odd pop-ups or the computer is slowing down terribly, then that's something where you may have been hacked and you want to make sure that IT is called and, and whoever is in charge of um, taking a look at that, make sure that they are looking at the computers and um, protecting whatever might, might become exposed. Um, anytime, like all of those emails, those funny emails that we were looking at where they're looking for, um, any sort of information um, from you. We want to make sure that we're not providing that. Um, and then also making sure that uh, if you've got any emails that are saying, hey, if you need to pay, you, you want to win this, you need to make a small payment, let's have a policy not to do that. That's not something that would be a smart thing to do. When it comes to the inside threats, and unfortunately, this is a, a larger percentage when it comes to local governments, a lot of times we just really have um, the basic problems going on. We have 
uh, no separation of duties. And that that's fairly common in smaller local governments because there's just not a lot of people and not a lot of budget for people to separate the duties. And so um, to the best of our abilities, we need to be able to separate the duties um, and make sure that there are checks and balances, make sure that um, people are not approving and paying um, invoices themselves, make sure that there is some sort of authorization policy or authentication um, policy to um, follow. And then making sure that we're not sharing passwords. This is something that I've actually done a few local government investigations and have been horrified to see passwords written on sticky notes stuck to the computer screen. And I, I know that it's hard to remember these passwords, especially when we're asked to change them fairly regularly, but um, leaving a password out for everyone to see is, is just asking for a, you know, a lot of trouble. Um, I did have a, a situation also just as a warning when you share passwords, the unfortunate thing is if something bad happens, um, you could end up being the, the person investigated. And we had a situation in a clerk of court office. Um, this has been a few years ago where one of the, um, one of the, the desk clerks um, had her password out and another colleague started um, stealing money when cash would be uh, brought in for uh, speeding tickets and that kind of thing, um, she would steal the cash and she would go into the computer system and she would manipulate the computer system to show that the ticket had been paid. But the weird thing was she would show that it was paid in the year 2040 um, if you went into the system. And so what that would do is it would allow and this was just the oddity of the system, but it would allow for that ticket to look paid and they wouldn't continue to harass the, the speeder to pay their ticket, but then it wouldn't show up as a cash receipt um, that needed to be on the deposit detail. And so nobody was looking for that cash. Well, when we investigated it, a number of these instances were actually in the name of the person who left their password on the, on the sticky note stuck to their computer screen. And so she was, we were having to investigate her just as well as the other individual. And it turned out we were able to um, absolve her partially at least because uh, many of the occasions of theft were taking place when she was not there. Um, she was either uh, on vacation or wasn't um, logged in that day working that day. So um, again, you know, that was a happy circumstance for her because she was on the hook um, in, under criminal investigation until uh, we were able to determine when she said, I didn't do this and I can, I can give you everything you need. And we were able to then look and see, yeah, she was at Myrtle Beach when some of this stuff was happening. But um, again, it was on her because she had left her password out for the world to see. Um, when it comes to internal controls, and we just talked about password security, um, this, is, uh, this is super, super important. So again, don't share your password with other employees or outsiders. Um, you know, sometimes people stick it in their desk drawer thinking that, well, I'll hide it by putting it on a sticky note in my desk drawer um, where they have all their passwords. Um, and they might even keep a key in there. Um, that type of thing is, is obviously not safe. And so, you know, the advice that, that we're regularly given is make sure that your passwords are um, complex enough. Um, and more and more are being recommended that you use long sentences with spaces and, and punctuation because that's just something harder to um, ascertain versus using my name's Karen123. Um, you want to make it make sure that it's not something that can be readily um, taken or, or figured out. 
The other thing is, these are a lot of obvious things, but using uh, different passwords instead of reusing the same passwords over and over, because once a fraudster gets a hold of a password, there's no telling what they can get into. They will keep trying. Um, the other thing is, if you're using your kids' names or your pet's names or your kid's birthday or your birthday, um, there's a lot of information on your social media pages uh, where you're sharing that, uh, you know, this is my birthday or happy birthday to Joshua, my son, that type of thing. Um, the fraudster can start running all kinds of um, queries to, to see if they can break into your data. And um, so one of the recommendations that we usually have for our clients is making sure that you have some sort of dual authentication um, or personalized USB token where if someone tries to log on from an external device, then at least you've got um, a notice that that is happening. And before they can actually access, you would have to approve it through your um, authentication device. And so that's something that, that um, you can certainly implement if you haven't already. When it comes to um, internal controls, our, our whole thing is train, 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 make sure that we're up to date and understanding the, the latest uh, techniques that people are implementing. Um, and then also slow down. This is a message we have for our staff at, at my firm is slow down because it's easy to click, 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 click through everything, trying to um, get through our emails or respond to something. And so long as uh, we slow down and look at the messages, see if it makes sense, did we expect it, that type of thing. Um, and if you are getting any of these types of correspondence, um, whether it be a, you know, a request to change a bank account, whether it be a request to update um, any sort of uh, company information, whatever it is that you're being asked to do, and it, it appears to be from either um, a customer or a vendor or somebody that we would want to make sure that we had up-to-date information, instead of um, instead of uh, just clicking on the links, call them. And, and I think we'll talk about that in, in, the, in the next slide, but make sure that you're not just clicking through and giving any sort of information online. Uh, the other thing is it's, it's pretty challenging to monitor people's social media usage because everyone seems to be tied to their cell phones and their Facebook pages and such. But um, that's another thing that, that we tend to uh, discourage just because there's so much risk. Um, if you have social media going on um, on your computers. And then lastly, the, the unauthenticated flash drives. We in our firm get a lot of flash drives with data from attorneys, um, but we always make sure to pick up the phone, call the attorney that we are working with, who we know, and make sure, did you send this to me? what's on the, the flash drive, and did you make sure that it, it was clean before you sent it? And we always wanna make sure that we're not just sticking a flash drive into your computer, because that's just a hack waiting to happen. Again, as I said before, you're gonna to want to confirm any of um, the changes or any sort of um, information um, that you're being requested to do something you're going to want to confirm that before you just automatically do it. And we recommend um, picking up the phone and speaking with somebody that you do know that's in authority um, at your either um, vendor or bank or whatever it is that you're having to um, to share information with. And so um, we always say at our firm, email is the devil. Um, it's kind of a joke, but it, it's sort of not. Um, and then you want to just make sure that you're um, implementing the, the, the separation of duties and, and making sure that you've got um, plenty of um, authorization and um, 
authentication before you start initiating wire transfers. That's where we see a lot of money flying out the door as we did with that law firm. With regard to um, best practices um, for, for uh, safeguarding your data, make sure, and this is not necessarily an online thing, but um, lock up your, your check, checkbook uh, or your check stock where you can print checks. Obviously, there's um, account numbers on that, but it's also an easy way we've seen where people can steal money. Um, a lot of people tend to hang their ID badges um, on their door or you know on their computer and not keeping it on their person. And with ID badges, obviously, you gain access to a lot of things. And then um, the last one about securing keys to the vault. In some of the municipality work that we've done, uh, when we've gone to City Hall, there's a, a vault where they keep cash and where they keep information. And remarkably, they will keep the vault open all day long. And yes, it's behind the desk, typically, um, of the administrator. But if she gets up, people are coming in and out of City Hall. And they can just go in and we've seen this on multiple occasions where the vault is visible and open and so that's just something to, to contemplate I doubt anybody here on the presentation is uh, does that but um, we have seen that also with your shred bins making sure that those are locked um, and that the only uh, parties able to access them are the, the the destruction company make sure that they are official destruction company and then perhaps somebody uh, in authority in your office but obviously that will contain a lot of sensitive information um, in terms of <clears throat> testing these things we recommend and we actually have this at our firm as well um, where we will test our vulnerabilities. You know, penetration testing is one way to see if somebody can hack into your system, but another way is simply to have somebody send um, benign uh, emails to your staff and see if they click on it. Um, and so we do that on a regular basis to make sure that our staff is staying vigilant and careful and not just clicking through. And so um, you can also have somebody uh, go in as a spy and just see how much um, sensitive information is laying around and could be visible uh, to passersby and um, let you know about that. But that's another thing that um, could potentially help you identify some issues. And then lastly, here are some resources. And Dan, I don't know if people are going to have access to this uh, presentation subsequently or not but if so um, you'll have the the links if not these are kind of long to write down but um, wanted to share some of the information uh, that, that I'll, I, be next. I'll be sending the recording uh, okay with the pdf version of your presentation great great and with that um that is what I have for you guys. Um, I appreciate your attention. We finished a little early. I'm hoping that there are some questions or comments or if anybody wants to share some of the their war stories that even if it's not yours, if you want to share what you've experienced, uh, I'd love to hear it. Questions or comments from uh, the attendees? Anybody have any questions? Karen, I thought you did a fantastic job. I, again, thank, thank you. you so much. While we're waiting on them, all those questions to roll in, I'm sure <laughs> we're at any minute now. So uh, I, I'm sure probably it's there's so many questions that it has it has uh, bound up the computer system, right? So it's not able to flow properly. But uh, well, I don't think we're getting any questions, Karen. But I think you all did right. a fantastic job. Thank you so very very much. Thank you. Uh, as, I, as I said, here we got that again. I'm going to thank you here. I I will uh, again. I'll be sending out the the recording, uh, the presentation, uh, with in the PDF format, and we will go from there. But thank you guys so much, and thank you so much to Karen. Uh, we'll Thanks have so a much. good day. And just for everyone on, Karen's going to be doing one next Tuesday. Uh, really, very similar topic. 
uh, but it will be based towards employees. So the premise is you can have your employees participate in this training and uh, they'll learn a little bit on what to do or not to do. So uh, she will actually, we will have uh, inserted within the presentation will be a little buzzer. And if anybody does things wrong, we'll buzz and, and electrify them. So that's something that, to help them out. Thank you guys so very much. We will talk to you later. Thanks, Thanks so much.